everyone, this is Jared Rand. Welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Friday, November 18th, 2022, 11 to 3 p.m. Eastern. We're having a time, a uh, reverse aging health call tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Along our journey through this life, we have probably experienced personal success and accomplishment from intense amounts of efforting. Most of us contain this deeply conditioned belief system inside that says, in order to reach my goals in this life, it will require a lot of hard work and persistence. This belief that we achieve our desires only through intense effort is an oldie and a goodie which contains a solid work ethic. Yet, when it comes to mastering our lives, I find that working hard is completely overrated and is mostly filled with dogmatic beliefs derived from some archaic, limited-minded consciousness. The illusion many of us are still living under is that we are not all powerful, infinite beings who can manifest anything we want. You see the difference? When, when a civilization is conditioned to believe that the only way to go anywhere is to work your fingers to the bone, to achieve success at the top of the ladder of the rat race, that way, see, you don't really ever learn that the, the flip side of the coin is to be able to know who and what you are within and to be in a manifesting energy. So the illusion many of us are still living under is that we are not all powerful infinite beings who can manifest anything we want. We have forgotten we are spiritual beings who are tapped into a web of energy, thought, and power. We've been blinded by the material world, thinking it is real, and have forgotten to look behind the curtain, as Toto finally did in the movie The Wizard of Oz. This means it is our basic animal nature and instincts that will reveal what's really going on. The truth is that we already have the ability to create whatever version of reality that we desire by merely, merely putting back, pulling back our shades and seeing what beliefs we are holding as true or real in our imaginations. The real power and science of manifesting is one that most people do not understand at first, as it breaks all boundaries of what is real and what is not real. Manifesting is meant to take us beyond our normal accepted paradigm of understanding. And once we get a taste of how real and easy it actually is, we can never go back. The ordinary day becomes extraordinary because we know the golden trick to this life. Most people would think you're silly to think you can manifest something with less effort instead of more. Yet these beings don't understand one fundamental principle. That all the real work in this life is not done in the outer world. It's all about elevating our inner world. This experience of inner elevation is like taking a high-speed elevator to the penthouse floor. I'd call this ride work, right? I would call this. I wouldn't call this ride work at all, as it is much better described as an enjoyable letting go process that is filled with deep joy, gratitude, trust, and a true release. We can effortlessly leap over our blocks 
and instead of pound through them to reach our goals and dreams. We simply ask for what we want and wait as the benevolent universe makes its way to deliver our desired outcome to us. In the world of manifesting, it's always essential to focus on feeling the end result. If you want a new relationship, what will it feel like when you're in one? This is our way of communicating to all creation that we are fully aligned with our highest soul's mission on this planet at this time. The quieter you become, the more you are able to hear Zen saying. The quieter you become, the more you are able to hear. One highly effective technique to start on the path of relaxation is to practice meditation. Simply experiment with sitting quietly and doing nothing, but following your breath, not your mind. You have an overly active mind and need assistance. You can say out loud, I am as you're breathing. Try saying I on the inhalation and am on your exhalation. Doing this practice after 10 minutes will cultivate a relaxed body and peaceful mind within as long as you have to no expectation on what should or shouldn't happen. When we start meditating daily, we will soon discover how noisy and chaotic our inner world can be and what it really takes to tame the mind and get super silent inside. As we discover that we can approach our minds from this more relaxed, expansive space, trusting that each moment and experience is the right one, we will find a deep, cosmic-like, peaceful feeling of the core of our body and mind. It's from living from this space that we find the power to start attracting some truly miraculous manifestations. When we stop all effort to get somewhere and let life carry us, we can actually love our lives as it is right now and taste this simple, sweet experience of bliss that lives inside of us all. From a non-efforting approach, we are still doing what we enjoy doing, helping others and making this world a better place. We are simply doing it from a relaxed body and mind. It's one, it's a thousand times easier for the divine power to enter your consciousness and start flowing through your actions more fully. It is like trying to create a foundation for a new house and receiving help from a bulldozer when you've been picking at it this entire time with a white plastic spoon. When you hand your life over to spirit, the sacred spirit takes over you and you discover Heaven exists on earth as the human being in you meets the divine. We could never imagine how easy it is to manifest anything we want until we put 100% of our faith in letting go and relaxing about the outcome we want to occur. The moment we stop trying so hard and really let go of how everything should happen, the universe feels this divine trust, then decides to fill us with its reward. This universe is truly benevolent and very attentive listener indeed. We may look back at our lives and think this thought is completely erroneous. 
and the world is a horrible place. Yet before we go there, hear these words. You, all of us, are love itself. All of us are love itself. There is nothing different than any of us, with any of us, and the source of love. There's nothing different. This is perhaps the greatest key I've found to reaching your highest vibration in this life. It is so simple and ridiculously profound that we might just overlook it. When we realize it's true, we start relaxing so deeply inside ourselves that we simply let go of the lowest vibrational thought forms and feelings. Who would have guessed that we just need to relax into the source of love itself in order to elevate our consciousness and truly master this world? This world is filled with paradoxes, the main one being that we think we are powerless and unloved, while in truth, we are deeply powerful and the source of love. Love is not something that comes from somebody else. This is a mere reflection of the real light that is always found within. Once you have conquered greed, nothing can limit your freedom. Once you have conquered greed, Nothing can limit your freedom, Buddha. And at the time, he was probably the wealthiest man on the planet. Lived in a huge palace. Had all kinds of material things. And then when he went out, he got a weird feeling because he would always ask the servants what goes on outside the walls of the palace, right? And so some of the servants started telling him it's a much different world out there. People are suffering, starving, and having all kinds of issues. And he wanted to find out for himself. So, in the middle of the night, a couple of servants helped him, and he escaped the palace. He left. He never came back. He gave up all of it. And so that's why... He knew, once you have conquered greed, nothing can limit your freedom. Once we become totally relaxed, we find that our body and mind is proof that we are an all-intelligent, powerful, loving, conscience presence, conscious presence that is deeply connected to source. Being relaxed is empirical evidence that we are one with this universe. Now, this doesn't mean you're checking out in a lazy coma through drugs, cigarettes, TV, or alcohol. Your mind would be too busy processing the chemicals to take a real vacation. Where it can reach your natural state of bliss within. A relaxed body and mind is like stepping into the house of blissful abundance. Our chakras, that we'll talk about more, energy channels, transform into a receiving mode, allowing our highest possible selves to show up with effortless joy and ease. So I refer to relaxation as a hidden power because it's not very obvious how powerful we are when we're truly relaxed. We may, be, we may feel peaceful, yet not always powerful. When we're super active in this life, moving rapidly, talking quickly, getting tons accomplished in our days, it's easier to think that we are an empowered being. Yet if you could do the same outer work, yet from a con consciously relaxed space, you 
you'd feel aligned with the universal God source, and that would know what real empowerment actually is. Anytime we are attempting to be overly successful, achieve too much in life, and propel ourselves forward faster to reach our highest goals quicker, we are missing the real goal of this life, to enjoy each moment of the journey and appreciate it all. How much can you enjoy the beauty of the Grand Canyon if you're driving 120 miles per hour alongside it? Not very much. Relaxation is absolutely vital to our success as human beings and as a conscious, enlightened manifester. If we think this approach is about not getting anything done and becoming more lazy, think again. This is relaxation that takes us to the source of consciousness, intent. As we truly let go of attachment to outcome, what could be lazy in that? It takes us consciously diving deeper where we feel grace is supporting our every breath. It is, it is only here we can remain centered in the highest vibrations of love, peace, oneness, without even trying. This is the only way we can experience what it means to truly be alive. Misery and despair it is what is left after we have gone through all the trouble of trying to satisfy the ego with money, knowledge, things, and power, only to find that the lower self can never be satisfied. Bobby. Most of the things that we contemplate or as we sit in silence, when the silent time comes in this guided meditation, where you just basically focus on the breath and be with no expectations or attachments. This is totally the opposite of what we've been trained to do as a civilization. It's a complete about face. And this is the pathway for all of us to begin to understand that the about face, the journey within, is what this life's all about. Only after the awareness of the distinction between intelligence and awareness. It is very easy to separate ourselves from the body. The body is so gross, we can feel it. We cannot be it. We must be inside it. It is easy to see that we cannot be the eyes. We must choose to be someone hidden behind who looks through the eyes. Otherwise, who will look through the eyes? Our glasses cannot look. Behind the glasses, eyes are naked. Our eyes are also like glasses. They are glasses. They cannot look. You are needed somewhere behind to look. But the subtlest identification is with intelligence, our power to think, our power of intellect, understanding. 
is the subtlest thing. It is very difficult to discriminate between awareness and intelligence, but it can be discriminated. By and by, step by step, first, know that you are not the body. By and by, step by step, first, know that you are not the body. Let that understanding grow deep and crystallize. Then know that you are not the senses. Let that understanding grow and crystallize. Then know you are not the ta- the tan matras, the energy pools behind the senses. Let that grow and crystallize. And then you'll be able to see that intelligence is also a pool of energy. It is the common pool in which eyes pour their energy, ears pour their energy, hands pour their energy. All the senses are like rivers, and intelligence is the central thing in which they bring information and pour. Whatever your mind knows is given by the senses. You have seen colors. Your mind knows them. If you are colorblind, if you cannot see the color green, then your mind does not know anything about green. Bernard Shaw lived his whole life unaware that he was colorblind. It's very difficult to come to know it. But one accidental incident allowed him to become aware. On one of his birthdays, somebody presented him a suit, but the tie was missing. So he went to the market to find a tie which could fit with the suit. The suit was green, and he started purchasing a yellow tie. His secretary was watching, and she asked, what are you doing? It won't fit. The suit is green, and the tie is yellow. And he said, is there a difference between these two? For 70 years, he had lived not knowing that he could not see yellow. He saw green. Whether it was yellow or green, both colors looked green. Yellow was not part of his mind. The eyes never poured that information into the mind. The eyes are like servants, information collectors, public relations officers, roaming all over the world, collecting things, pouring into the mind. They go on feeding the mind. The mind is the central pool. First, we have to become aware that we are not the eyes, not the energy that is hitting behind the eyes. Then we will be able to see that every sense is pouring into the mind. We are not this mind. We are the one who is seeing it being poured. We are just standing on the bank all the rivers pouring into the ocean. We are the watchers, the witnesses. Swami Ram has said, science is difficult to define, but perhaps the most essential feature of it involves the study of something which is external to the observer. The techniques of meditation offer an approach which allows one to be external to one's own internal states. The techniques of meditation offer an approach which allows one to be external to one's own 
internal states. And the ultimate of meditation is to know that whatever you can know, you are not it. Whatever you can know, you are not it. Whatever can be reduced to a known object, you are not it. Because you cannot be reduced to an object. You remain eternally subject, the knower. The knower, the knower. And the knower can never be reduced to the known. This is clear awareness. This is the final understanding that arises out of yoga. Meditate over. When we move the body, whether it be Tai Chi, yoga, of course it's stretching and exercising, but you begin to realize that you are not the body. You can watch the body move. You can experience the body, but you are not the body. Do you ever watch people dance? Or yourself. Have you ever danced where you've just lost all connection with outside of you? That everything is flowing within? And you, you, you're you not in the body at that moment. You're watching the body. And you're totally oblivious to everything going on around you. Have you seen people do that? The yoga system of Patanjali is not a philosophical system. It is empirical. It is a tool to work with. But still it has philosophy. That too is just to give an intellectual understanding of where you are moving, what you are seeking. But philosophy is arbitrary, utilitarian, Just to give a comprehensive picture of the territory, you are going to discover. But the philosophy has to be understood. You can look up Patanjali. First thing about his philosophy is that he divides human personality into five seeds, five bodies. He says you don't have one body. You have layers upon layers of bodies. Five layers. The first body he calls Aname, Kosh, the food body, the earth body, which is made of earth and is constantly to be nourished by food. Food comes from the earth. If you stop taking food, your Aname Kosh will wither away. So one has to be very alert what one is eating because that makes you and it will affect you in millions of ways sooner or later your food is now just food it becomes blood your bones your very marrow it circulates in your being it goes on affecting you so the purity of food creates a pure anime kosh, the pure food body. And if the first body is pure, light, not heavy, then it is easy to enter the second body. Otherwise, it will be difficult. You will be loaded. Have you seen that when you have eaten too much and heavy food? Immediately you start feeling a sort of sleep, a sort of lethargy, especially about this time of year. You would like to go to sleep. Awareness immediately starts disappearing. When the first body is loaded, it is difficult to create great awareness. Hence, fasting became so important in all the religions. But fasting is a science, and one should not fool around with it, like many people do. There 
was a Sonny Austin who came and said that she's been fasting and now her whole body, her whole being is disturbed, tremendously disturbed. Now the stomach is not functioning well. And when the stomach is not functioning well, everything is weakened. The vitality is lost. And we cannot be alive. We become more and more insensitive and dead. Believe it or not, there is a an understanding from a view where there are certain kinds of parasites that you can see, or bugs, whatever you want to call them. Sometimes those parasites will leave your body, if your body is dead to a certain extent, and it, they will be drawn to another body that has more life to it. Now, you don't necessarily feel this, but that's how subtle it can be. But fasting is important. It should be done very carefully. One should understand the functioning of the anamekha. Only then. And it should be done under the proper guidance of one who has moved through all the phases of his anamekha. Not only that, one who has gone beyond it and who can look at the anime kosh as a witness. Otherwise, fasting can be dangerous. Then, just the right amount of food and the right quality of food has to be practiced. Fasting is not needed. But this is important because this is our first body. And more or less, people cling to their first body. They never move to the second. Millions of people are not even aware that they have a second body, a deeper body, hidden behind the first sheath. The first covering is very gross. The second body, Papa Jelly calls, Pranamay the energy body, electric body. Pranamekash means energy body, electric body. The second body. The second consists of electric fields. That's what acupuncture is all about. The second body is more subtle than the first. And people who start moving from the first body to the second become fields of energy, tremendously attractive, magnetic, and hypnotic. If you go near them, you will feel vitalized, charged. If you go near a man who lives only in his food body, you will be depleted. He will suck your energy. Many times, we come across people and we feel that they drain us, suck us dry. After they have left, we feel depleted. You ever experience that? That doesn't necessarily mean you have to know the person. And they will drain you. Many times we come across people and we feel that they drain us. After they have left, we feel depleted, dissipated, as if somebody has exploited our energy. The first body is a sucker. And the first body is very gross. So if we live too much with first body oriented people, we will feel always burdened, tense, bored, sleepy, with no energy, always at the point of the lowest rung of our energy. And we will not have any energy which can be used for higher growth. You ever been with someone like that? This type, the first type, the Anamekos, 
oriented person lives for food. They eat and eat and eat. And that's their whole life. They remain in a way childish. The first thing that the child does in the world is to suck air and then to suck milk. And the first thing the child has to do in the world is to help the food body. And if a person remains food addicted, they remain childish. Their growth suffers. The second body, the pranamekas, which is electric, which is energy, gives us a new freedom, gives us more space. The second body is bigger than the first. It is not confined to our physical body. It is inside the physical body, and it is outside the physical body. It surrounds us like a subtle climate, an aura of energy. Now, in Russia, they have discovered that photographs can be taken of this energy body. They call it bioplasma. But it exactly means prana, the energy. Elan, vital. Or what Taoists call chi. It can be photographed. Now it has become almost scientific. A very great discovery has been done in Russia. And that is that before your physical body suffers an illness, the energy body suffers it six months before. Then it happens to the physical body. If you're going to have tuberculosis or cancer or any illness, your energy body starts showing indications of it six months before. No examination, no testing of the physical body shows anything. Guilt show. But the electric body starts showing it. First it appears in the praname cause. Then it enters the anime cause. So now they say that it has become possible to treat a person before they have fallen ill. Once it becomes so, then there is no need for humanity to fall ill. Before we become aware that we are ill, our photographs by Karelian methods will show that some illness is going to happen to our physical body. It can be prevented in the pranamaka. That's why yoga insists so much on the purity of breathing. Because the pranamakash is made of a subtle energy that travels with the breathing inside of us. If we breathe rightly, our pranamakash remains healthy and whole and alive. Such a person never feels tired. Such a person is always available to do anything. Such a person is always responsive, always ready to respond to the moment, ready to take the challenge. They are always ready. They will never find themselves unprepared for any moment. Not that they plan for the future. But they have so much energy that whatever happens, they are ready to respond. They have overflowing energy. Tai Chi works on pranamekash. Pranayam works on pranamekash. If you know just how to breathe naturally, you will grow into your second body. And the second body is stronger than the first. And the second body lives longer than the first. When somebody dies, for almost three days, you can see their bioplasma. Sometimes that is mistaken for their ghost. The physical body dies, but the energy body continues to move. 
And those who have experimented deeply about death say that for three days it is very difficult for the person who has died to believe that they have died because the same form and more vital than ever, more healthy than ever, more beautiful than ever surrounds them. It depends on how big a bioplasma you have. Then it can continue for 13 days or even for more. Around the Samadhis of Vilgus, in India, they burn everybody's body except the body of the one who has attained to Samadhi. We don't burn that body for a certain reason. Once we burn the body, the bioplasma starts moving away from the earth. We can feel it for a few days, but then it disappears into the cosmos. But if the physical body is left, then the bioplasma can cling to it. And those who have attained samadhi, who have become enlightened, if their bioplasma can remain somewhere around their samadhi, many people will be benefited by it. That's how many people come to see their guru's forms. In the Aurobindo ashram, Aurobindo's body is put and a samadhi, not destroyed, not burned. Many people have felt as if they have seen Aurobindo around it. Or sometimes they have heard the same footsteps, the way Aurobindo used to walk. And sometimes he is there just standing before them. This is not Aurobindo. This is the bioplasma. Aurobindo is gone. But the bioplasma, the pranamikash, can persist for centuries. If the person has been really in tune with their pranamikash, it can persist. It can have its own existence. Natural breathing has to be understood. Watch small children. They breathe naturally. That's why small children are so full of energy. The parents are tired. But the children, they are not tired. One child was saying to another child, I'm so full of energy that I wear out my shoes within seven days. Another said, that's nothing. I'm so full of energy, I wear out my clothes within three days. And the third said, that too is nothing. I'm so full of energy, I wear out my parents within one hour. In America, they have done an experiment. One very powerful man, an athletic body with tremendous energy, was told to follow a small child and imitate. Whatsoever the child does, this athlete has to do. Just imitate for eight hours. Within four hours, the athlete was gone, flat on the floor, because the child enjoyed it very much. He started doing many things, jumping, jogging, shouting, yelling, and the athlete has just to repeat. And the child was perfectly full of energy. After four hours, the athlete was gone. He said, he will kill me. Eight hours, finished. I cannot do anything more. He was a great boxer, but boxing is one thing. You cannot compete with a child. From where does the energy come? It comes from the pranamikash. A child breathes naturally, and of course, breathes more prana in, more chi in, and accumulates it in his belly. The belly is the accumulating place, the reservoir. Watch a child, that is the right way to breathe. When you watch a child, that is the right way to breathe. When a child breathes, their chest 
is completely unaffected. Their belly goes up and down. They breathe as if from the belly. All children have a little belly. That belly is there because of their breathing and the result and the reservoir of energy. That is the right way to breathe. Remember to use your chest. Remember to not use your chest too much. Sometimes it can be used in emergency periods. You are running to save your life. Then the chest can be used. It is an emergency device. Then we can use shallow, fast breathing and run. But ordinarily, the chest should not be used. And isn't it interesting? You go out, we've all been to a doctor, doc, family doctor, right? General practitioner. And so they take the stethoscope, right? And they tell you to sit straight and take in deep breaths through the chest. Interesting, isn't it? when that is a no-no. And one thing to be remembered, because the chest is meant only for emergency situations, because it is difficult in an emergency situation to breathe naturally. If we breathe naturally, we remain so calm and quiet, we cannot run, we cannot fight. We are so calm and collected we are Buddha-like. And in an emergency, the house is on fire. If you breathe naturally, you will not be able to save anything. Or if a tiger jumps upon you in a forest and you go on breathing naturally, you will not be bothered. You will say, okay, let him do whatever he wants. You will not be able to protect yourself. So nature has given an emergency device. The chest is an emergency device. When a tiger attacks you, you have to drop natural breathing and you have to breathe by the chest. Then you will have more capacity to run, to fight, to burn energy fast. And in an emergency situation, there are only two alternatives, fight or flight. Both need a very shallow but intense energy. Shallow but a very disturbed, tense state. Now, if we continuously breathe from the chest, we will have tensions in our mind. If we continuously breathe from the chest, we will always be afraid because the chest is breathing, is meant only in fearful situations. And if we have made it a habit, then we will continuously be afraid, tense, always in flight. And the enemy is not there. But we will imagine the enemy is there. And that's how paranoia is created. In the West also, a few people have come across this phenomenon. Alexander Lowen and other bioenergetic people who have been working on bioenergy, that is prana, and they have come to feel that in people who are afraid, the chest is tense and they are breathing very shallow breaths. If their breathing can be made deeper to go and touch the belly, the hara center, then their fear disappears. If their musculature can be relaxed, as is done in Rolfing, Ida Rolf, who invented one of the most beautiful methods to change the inner structure of the body. Because if you have been breathing wrongly for many years, you have developed a musculature. And that musculature will be in the way and will not allow you to rightly breathe or deeply breathe. And even if you remember for a few seconds and breathe deeply, again, when you are engaged in your work, you will start shallow chest breathing. And most of us on this planet, shallow chest breathe. The musculature has to be changed. Once the musculature is changed, 
the fear disappears and the tension disappears. Rolfing is tremendously helpful, but also working on pranamakash, the second bioplasma body, bio energy body, chi body, or whatsoever you want to call it, watch a child. That is natural breathing. And breathe that way. Let your belly come up when you inhale. Let your belly go down when you exhale. And let it be in such a rhythm that it becomes almost a song in your energy, a dance with rhythm, with harmony. And you will feel so relaxed, so alive, so vital that you cannot imagine that such vitality is possible. I'll join you in the meditation, and I'll return to close us out.
take an easy and slow breath in through the nose and an easy slow breath out of the mouth be still Look even deeper within. What is generating your thoughts? Where is the source of the thoughts that are coming through your mind right now? Ask yourself randomly today. If you are not this whirlwind of thoughts, who are you? Then look beneath them and beyond them. Sit with this question for at least 10 minutes today. Where are my thoughts coming from? The infinite universe, your consciousness, and change are the only three constant things in this life. The infinite universe, your consciousness, and change are the only three constant things in this life. Meditate on them all throughout your day today. Practice embracing this truth on all levels, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Let this truth seep deeply into your core. Take this with you for the rest of the day into the evening and night, the following morning. We will return here tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, to continue our reverse aging health call. And Saturday. November 19th, 2022, 3 p.m. Eastern, to continue our global guided meditation call.